there should be an agency for fun, fun, healthy, and happy. And I'm saying that you'll see in a reason. When we talk about equity and how we design parks to be equitable, uh, there are ways both consciously or subconsciously we design it to be actually to not be equitable. We don't want to see basketball. Uh, we have rules. There are so many rules, it makes the park unfun, and I don't even want to be there. Uh, so we know there's a way you could do it with the rules. You could do it with design. You could do it with the number of grills. In fact, there was a park in Queens that was a football field. The demographics were changing. Soccer was being played. And literally before I got there, the Parks Department planted trees in the football field to avoid people from playing soccer on the football field. As we looked to the future about fun, healthy, the true. we took the trees out, by the way. <laughs> They're gone. So <laughs> I'm um, happy to be here for the next about hour. We're going to be talking about these issues of resilience and equity as it pertains to our public realm. Um, and we have uh, the most terrific panel to help us get there. Um, I'm not going to go into long introductions because they're in your program. And also, conveniently, everybody is sitting in front of their picture. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I can very briefly. Uh, say Maria Belan Power is uh, Associate Executive Director of Green Roots. That's where we were visiting in Chelsea. It's a community-based organization dedicated to enhancing the life, uh, urban life and health of Chelsea and its surrounding communities. Uh, next, Nick Brack. I have this in order too. Nick Black is the Managing Director of Boston, the Boston Waterfront Initiative for the Trustees of Reservations. You may know that the trustees are involved in a really ambitious plan to try to um, develop uh, welcoming, resilient public uh, waterfront spaces in our uh, district. Um, Priscilla Geigas is uh, Deputy Commissioner of, uh, for Conservation and Resource Stewardship at the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, which has a 125-year legacy of um, providing free and open uh, public spaces for the residents of Massachusetts, including many um, waterfront uh, properties. And uh, Chris Reed is founding director of STAS. Um, it is a uh, Boston and Los Angeles based, I did not know that, um, uh, architecture and design uh, and urban planning firm. Uh, he also teaches at the Harvard GSD. Um, he works on climate related planning and design initiatives across North America and indeed globally. So we have a lot of um, ground to cover. It, climate change, which we heard in this last presentation, is an obviously it's a threat. It is in some cases an existential threat. Um, but it also, uh, you know, I'm going to try to leaven the conversation a little bit and say that it also does provide some opportunities for new ways of thinking about planning in our cities, about um, new ways of communicating across uh, various boundaries, you know, whether they be community or um, sector boundaries. And so I wanted to start by asking, um, I think I'll start with Chris on that end, um, to, just to talk a little bit about, even in the face of um, these rising challenges of, of climate change and sea level rise, um, if you see opportunities and what they might be. Sure. Um, no, it's an exciting moment uh, in Boston right now. Um, where climate is giving the city and all of us an excuse uh, for Boston to reclaim its legacy of landscape uh, in many ways. You all know that Frederick Law Olmsted uh, designed the Emerald Necklace um, in the 19th century, a string of parks uh, that really connected the entire city and was intended to connect all the way to Boston Harbor. Um, this string of parks is important, it provided open space opportunities, recreational opportunities. It created new habitat. Uh, but it also served in key places as flood control, particularly along the Muddy River, um, and gave us opportunities to integrate uh, what we would now call transportation or mobility infrastructure, parkways, cartways that were integrated as part of these um, uh, park systems. Uh, the parts of the Green Line were also integrated as part, parts of these systems. So these weren't just parks. Uh, they were really multifunctional park systems that connected uh, many parts of the system and gave uh, open space opportunities 
to the entire population of the city, rich, poor, or otherwise. Um, what's interesting about climate through the 20th century, particularly the late 20th century, Boston wasn't doing a lot of comprehensive planning. Uh, it was doing a lot of uh, urban design work. It was doing a lot of individual site or development based work. Um, but it wasn't doing, there wasn't anything that was integrating that other than good notions of what makes a good urban fabric. Climate because sea level rise does not respect individual property lines. Uh, climate gives us an opportunity to think collectively again because we have to. Um, and the last panel was really great in terms of putting on the table that we don't want to do it as all gray walls. The idea that you can do it as multifunctional open space that certainly provides flood protection but also offers opportunities for open space, recreation, waterfront access for everyone um, that integrates um, uh, uh, initiatives that allow us to clean water, create new habitat, that allow us to cool temperatures within the city. Um, uh, this kind of integrated infrastructure and open space system gives us opportunities to do so many new things now. Uh, and it's a great moment for Boston to be capitalizing on those efforts. Well, that's great. I'm, I want to just jump over to Nick because I know he has something similar, well, similar, but uh, to enhance upon that point. Yeah, so the initiative that we've undertaken is really an opportunity to try and implement a lot of these different solutions that we've been talking about today. Uh, to say, with the limited amount of space that we have left, with the development that's already going to be occurring, what can be done to actually create these green solutions in a way that are uh, really accessible to the public? Um, and I think the trustees, we see ourselves uh, as someone who's been around for quite a long time, it's 126 years at, at this juncture, um, who steward properties uh, across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, 116 different properties, everything from farms to coastland to um, urban uh, public gardens here in Boston. And so we've really tried to take a hard look to see what can we do to actually achieve some of this. Um, and through a, a, a long process, um, uh, supported uh, in no small part by our friends at the Bar Foundation, uh, really look to see um, where are these opportunities and, and what can we do now and today? And, and what are the sort of proof of concept ideas that we can really take from um, you know, the, the planning stages and, and, and implement them? And one of the, I, I guess the framework that we've been doing this in is, is with four key pillars. First of all, we're looking to see what we can do with some world-class destination design. We want to build a place or places that actually really draws the public down to the water. It gives people an opportunity who wouldn't normally come to, to, to see it for themselves and experience it for themselves. We want to do it in a climate resilient manner. Um, we want to make sure that we keep equity in mind in, in every aspect of the development and construction of, uh, of a place like this. And then ultimately, we want to do it in a, in a way that's financially feasible. How do we support not only the, the capital construction costs up front, but the long-term um, operations and maintenance uh, f for these places going forward. And so uh, that's kind of a, our approach to this problem. Um, I'm probably going to steal the commissioner's line about happy, healthy, and fun, uh, because I think that's a, an excellent way to sum up what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and, and how do we um, do this for not only the, the local residents in the neighborhoods that are going to be immediately affected and impacted by these places, but for the city uh, as a whole and also the region as a whole, too. So, Maria, when we talk about resilience in a, a sort of community context, um, it may have a somewhat different um, meaning or a different manifestation than, um, you know, pr protecting the Federal Reserve building from flooding. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about the opportunities that you see in addressing climate challenges in communities? Yeah, so I think, um, I think in order to understand and to think about the opportunities, it's really important to look at the context of Chelsea and communities like Chelsea and East Boston, um, where, you know, Chelsea in 1.8 square miles, we have... Is this on? Yeah. We have um, f over 45,000 residents, um, only one third of which is zoned for residential. And so if we look at the land and the population, 24% lives below the poverty line. I think it's important to understand the context and the industrial burden that we carry. And I think 
you know, two of the opportunities that I, that I think are important to remember are investments. And so green infrastructure is expensive. And so we believe that environmental justice communities should be priori uh, priority, should be prioritized. Um, and then the second piece is really rethinking resiliency. So resiliency is often think about as saving the, the building or not allowing flooding. But when we think of resiliency, we think of the community. What are they being displaced? Um, is the park that's being built going to raise the rents and therefore going to evict the tenants there? 75% of the residents in Chelsea, of the units in Chelsea, are renter occupied. So 75% of the population in Chelsea is prone to displacement. So I think those, those uh, rethinking resiliency and are there um, ways that we can incorporate um, eviction and housing crisis and immigration crisis um, and the entire uh, picture of our communities, not just uh, making sure that the buildings don't flood. Excellent. You know, I, I've been intrigued by the way that the city of Boston, which um, was named by the Rockefeller Foundation of one of the hundred resilient cities um, in the world, um, explicitly in their uh, application for this designation, um, talked about uh, racial equity and uh, resilience in the context of um, communities that bounce back from um, a history of division in, in our town. So I, I think there's actually a way to connect those two um, pieces, and I, I find that something uh, that will help us, you know, going into the future. Um, so Priscilla, um, you're uh, in charge or of, of uh, public properties in an uh, institution that's been around for 125 years. I know you haven't been there for 125 years, but... Um, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, yeah, sometimes it feels like it, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question about the changes that we see in um, the demographics of people who are using our public parks, um, and particularly waterfront parks, um, and how you've been able to think about programming or the design of these parks in such a way that they be, are welcoming to these changing demographics. We had a little discussion about this on the phone, I hope you remember. Um, with, you had a specific example about it that I, I just thought was perfect, and I hope you'll talk about that a little. Um, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here, and I also just... That's on. Is it on? Okay, great. Um, I, I also just wanted to, to echo something that was said earlier, just in terms of the vision, and, and Renee, you mentioned that it is our 125th anniversary, and, and we're talking about 125 years of sh stewardship, and it really was that vision that Elliot had of creating that Metropolitan Parks Commission, and so that was one of our pre predecessor agencies, the, the MDC and DEM, and, and we became DCR in 2003. Um, but that vision is, is really important because it's something that it gives us that opportunity now, as you said, to, to have that vision going forward. And um, we have tried to do that. You know, we've tried to change with the changing demographics of our parks and, and trying to um, make them accessible and make them fun and make them inviting. And so the example that I gave when we were on the phone is that we're noticing that there are a lot of people that are coming to the parks that um, that are multi-generational. And the idea is to come to the park and to spend the whole day at the park and to have breakfast and to make a nice lunch and to make a nice dinner. I'll tell you, sometimes I go by these places and I smell these, you know, meals and I think, oh my gosh, this is this is amazing. And what we've had to do is we've had to actually make some bigger grills for people because of the families, which which is great and that's a wonderful problem to have. But um, you know, we want to make sure that people are, you know, feel welcome and, and feel inviting. We're also trying to um, we're trying to install some other pavilions across the agency as well because we're noticing not just, you know, in waterfront areas, but, you know, we have 450,000 acres all across the state that we manage on behalf of all of you. So we're really trying to make some of those improvements and really look at, you know, what, what do people want? What are people looking for uh, in those areas? So that was the example that I gave yeah, you before. And I think all of you are involved in um, the design and maintenance of uh, public spaces that in a way are sort of the, other than libraries, maybe the last free public spaces that we even have in society. And yet, I, I'm just gonna ask you again, Priscilla, all of you, um, 
and yet the commitment to the public realm on the part of the taxpayers is, we can all say, especially on the federal level and even locally, is diminishing. Um, so you probably, the, the DCR probably is tied with the MBTA for the number, the millions of dollars of deferred maintenance um, that you face. So what, what strategies do you have or you could recommend even to others to help people care about somebody else's park? Um, and and see you know the the larger picture of why we need a statewide network of of open spaces in the public realm instead of just people caring about their own little piece of it. Well, you know, stewardship is so important, and that's why we're you know celebrating 125 years of stewardship. And I always say that everyone has a role to play in preserving and enhancing all of our parks and, and the natural resources and the cultural resources. And so it's so important for people to see this as a system and everybody does love their own particular park, but the beauty of our system is we have so many different diverse places. So you can be on the waterfront. I always say you can be um, on the Boston Harbor Islands and see the sunrise. You can be out at Greylock and see the sunset all in the same day. And it's really important to show people that we have that diversity. You know, Massachusetts is the ninth largest park system in the sixth smallest state. And so we're really proud of that and all of the diversity in between. And so I think in, in order to be able to have that diversity and to be able to be on coastlines or on, on lakes or climb mountains or hills, you really have to have that sense of ownership and that sense of shared stewardship and that it can't just be all about a particular park. Now what I will say is I think that that stewardship though manifests itself in our friends groups and we really appreciate that. And I know Suzanne is here um, from one of our uh, friends groups who and and we really want people to feel that ownership and, and also to feel that investment to help us provide some of the programming and to provide some of the resources that really enhance that visitor experience and make it a fun and accessible experience as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the strategies that I know we've we've accessed here in Boston quite a bit is the sort of public-private partnership for um, helping to uh, you know enhance the resources for um, these spaces. And yet, there's you know there's sometimes often perhaps a tension between uh, those kinds of arrangements and access. Right? Um, I'm thinking. I'm actually thinking about Bryant Park in New York City. Um, you know, a beautiful, successful public partner, pu public-private partnership that yet closes. As you say, the parks close. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if anybody here has any thoughts about that, about how to um, take the take advantage of of the interest in public-private partnerships while still maintaining an open, welcoming, diverse public space. Yeah, I think there are a number of examples um, from the last decade or two that get into this issue. Discovery Green in Houston is one with a lot of programmed activity uh, and a lot of demand on spaces to be revenue generating. I think those things um, require very careful planning, design, and management simultaneously so that major pieces of those open spaces, those public spaces, remain open uh, to the public even while some of those private activities uh, are happening. So there are very careful, coordinated strategies that you can develop. Here what's interesting is um, we're, I think we're starting to move beyond that too um, uh, or, or build on it. We're, we're looking at uh, some of the work we did in East Boston, significant public access and significant public infrastructure, right, mm. on private land, mm. on the waterfront that's defending populations of people inland. By private land, you mean Massport owned land? What no, do you mean by I private mean land? Pri uh, land in private um, possession. Okay. So along the East Boston waterfront, for instance, a lot of that uh, property is private. It's not, not in the public realm. Um, so how do you use tools, planning tools, zoning tools, um, to begin to think about linkages, um, how you take open space requirements and configure the footprint of open space on sites that allow direct public access from the communities inland uh, mm. to the waterfront mm. and then along the waterfront. For instance, Boston has a requirement that 50% of every private property be open space. 
meaning open to the sky. You can configure that, and there are examples uh, from the past in East Boston where that doesn't seem like it's publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work we did was to try to use that same toolkit that was available and configure and assemble the, that, the, the open space that was required anyway into something that was well connected into the urban fabric, well connected along the shoreline, so that you're creating a benefit for the folks who, um, not, not just those that are moving in, but the folks who already live there in neighborhoods that are blocks in. That in part is you know accessibility um, uh, to open space as part of the kind of equity um, uh, agenda that was built into a project like that. But it's also requiring um, new ways of thinking about ownership, management, maintenance, operations going forward. There's not a clear strategy for how to do that, and that's one of the challenges um, that many folks in the city are trying to figure out now. What are those groups and organizations that can take on responsibility uh, for uh, maintaining and operating some of this new open space, even if it happens to be on public land. I think, I think there are actually some really interesting models that we can start to think about and talk about, but it's requiring uh, multiple new partnership opportunities between the private sector, public sector, philanthropic sector, and nonprofit sector to kind of uh, figure this out going yeah. forward. I was say, as someone who stands to be one of those private partners to to maintain this public space, I think that's that's very important. But I, I did just want to sort of connect this back to something that, that Maria said that I, I feel is very important to, to talk about. We've, we talked a lot about equity and fairness today, but uh, it, it, study after study has shown that creating these types of open spaces, particularly along the waterfront, has a dramatic economic value to the city, and that increases the property values in the adjacent areas. Um, and the question is, who benefits from that? And how do you make sure that you configure the space and program the space and develop it in a way that uh, actually provides opportunity for those communities that are directly impacted? So for example, the, the, the folks at the uh, Friends of the High Line did a study to where, you know, obviously the High Line created um, some dramatic value for the land that was uh, immediately adjacent to the High Line. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a, at least anecdotally that I have heard, uh, initially they had some trouble attracting diverse audiences and, and, and crowds. And so they went to them to say, hey, what, what types of activities do you want to see here? And, and what would bring you to the park? And, and the thing that they were most interested in was actually uh, workforce training and job opportunities. It wasn't necessarily coming to the park to enjoy the amenities, but working at the park. And, and what sort of um, economic benefit can they, the neighbors of this open space, share? And so it, it, it to us is, is, is really critical to look at not only how you build the space, you want to make sure that the folks who are actually putting the shovels in the ground are local tradesmen who are, you know, a, here in the neighborhood building the, the, the space, but also working with the local businesses to uh, sustain the amenities of the space. Make sure that you're bringing in local restaurants and not just having some generic vendor from, you know, who manages 50 ballparks across the country serving hot dogs, but what can you do to get the, the local empanada guy from the corner to come into the park and actually um, be part of the community. And so really it's, it's focusing on the local employment, the, the local businesses, and the, 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 the workforce benefit. Uh, you, you have to do all of that consciously. You can't just sort of say, all right, well, we built a park. We expect all this to sort of trickle down and, and flow out into the community because it's, it's not going to unless you specifically say, well, we want to make an effort to go to the community, talk to the, the, the people on the ground to find out what they need and what benefits that we can provide to them and um, how do we actually really take those next steps to, to be, you know, conscientious and in, in, in sharing that equity and in, in being fair in that regard as well. This is a really important point. Uh, I, I would extend that to jobs um, building out um, the open space and development and infrastructure uh, to come uh, and to really good policy changes um, that embed into uh, communities uh, areas that are allowed uh, to grow and develop and, and invite new residents and other areas that are protected for the residents that are there 
uh, and the kind of infill small scale community development that's happening. We worked on some uh, a project in Pittsburgh that's doing just that. They're changing their zoning code to make sure that the benefits in different geographies of the planning study are there for different uh, communities, uh, keeping people in place in some areas uh, and allowing for new kinds of growth and development in others. Yeah, I mean, the question of gentrification always comes up when you're talking about um, enhancing the public realm, right? Um, you know, you create these beautiful spaces. Uh, it's true in East Boston as well as down here on the waterfront. Um, and before you know it, there were million dollar condos and people are, are uh, you know, Long-time residents are threatened by by these changes. So, I mean, is there any way to avoid that effect? I mean, do you have any any strategies? Are there? I mean, I I know, you know, other than, you know, canceling capitalism, um, which might be a, who might be a good idea. Um, is there a way to uh, protect against this these effects of gentrification and displacement? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I was going to say one uh, one thing that I would add to the idea of public-private partnerships mm -hmm. is making sure management and design are figured out as well as accountability. I, because I feel like a lot of times these are public dollars that are being managed privately and there's um, there needs to be accountability in that. Um, and then also Chapter 91 licenses have been a great tool for us in Chelsea and East, and East Boston for creating more access to the waterfront for the most vulnerable populations. Um, I mean, I do. I don't. I don't want to, you know, follow your joke. But I do think we need to think about the economic structure that we're in, and uh, you know, thinking about rents and thinking about how can we really keep people in place. And there are tools uh, that seem very un unreal, uh, but for protecting residents that are most at, at risk of being displaced. And so how are we just letting speculation uh, decide what rents are like in Chelsea or East Boston or some of the most low income uh, diverse communities? Uh, we don't think that's we don't think that's equitable and we don't think that's fair. And so I do think there needs to be a dramatic change in how we think of the economic system that we are and using some current tools in housing and rent structures that would help people stay in place. Yeah, I think that one tool that I've, I've heard a lot about uh, recently are these community land trusts, which basically take the land out of the private market. It is kind of canceling capitalism in that case. I mean, it's a, it's a one-off kind of thing. It's not systemic, you know, it's it's ad hoc, um, you know, it doesn't solve the whole problem, but is it a, a tool that you've Absolutely. Used? So we are uh, developing a community land trust in Chelsea uh, with Green Roots, and I do think that's a way of proving a model of taking land off the market um, and really stabilizing communities. It, you know, like you said, it's only one tool in a big, a larger uh, toolbox, but I do think that it's it's proven to stabilize communities across the country, and if we can replicate those models, I think that would really stabilize communities. That's great. And Go ahead. So I, I don't have the answer for that, but I did want to mention a program that we have in Chelsea that I think helps to build stewardship, and that's our Greening the Gateway Cities program. And um, many people know of DCR as um, 450,000 acres of, of wonderful places that you can recreate in, but they don't necessarily see the conservation side that we have. And we have an urban forestry program, and our urban foresters are going to the gateway cities, including Chelsea, and planting trees and really trying to, you know, not just beautify the area, but also um, reduce energy costs and, and really... Um, help people be good stewards and, and understand, you know, in terms of climate change and resiliency. Um, but we hire local people to help plant the trees with urban foresters, and they also care about those trees, and it, and it just makes a, a nicer space um, for them with all those other benefits. And so I think it's important to, to um, so again, I don't, I don't have the answer of how do we prevent that, because you, we're really trying to build communities, and we're really trying to uh, make sure that people have those equitable spaces that we have in other places. And so we're, so in Chelsea, you know, we're targeting places that have the older housing stock, and. Uh, in the in the rental areas, so just wanted to add that. That's great, Nick. Is it the only other sort of flip side of that is you know we're we're talking a lot about displacing the people who already live there, but one of the other challenges that we face here in Boston is getting the people who don't live there down to the water, and how do we open it up for everybody? And I think making sure that these o fantastic open spaces that that we're talking about that we're looking to build are available and feel like they're for everybody is to make sure that we have 
the, the cultural reflections of the communities within the spaces themselves, whether that's through the art, through the uh, programming activities, the education pieces, um, making sure that we give kids from Roxbury a reason to come down to the water. I mean, they love taking the boats out to the, uh, the Harbor Islands. There's already a number of programs in place to do that. But how do we expand that beyond the kids so that the families come back uh, on, on the weekends as well and, and, and joins them? And so um, that, I think, is, is also a, an important thing to be talking about and thinking about when, when we're looking at the equity and fairness is not only the, the people who are there now and, and making sure that we don't do anything that is uh, extra harmful in terms of displacement, but what, what do we do to actually open up this water that everyone paid to clean and that everyone's paying to now protect us from the, the rising sea level? What do we do to, to, to make it a place for everybody? Right, precisely. I, um, I see that we're about ready for questions from the audience, but I, I just wanted to you know, reinforce the point you made about how everybody paid to clean up the harbor. You know, it was an investment that, that the entire community made. We're talking about really uh, you know, from, from Quincy to Lynn. Um, not just, you know, around Boston. And there, there ought to be, I, I feel like there ought to be a peace dividend. You know, remember we, you know, we talked about the peace dividend when the, when the wall came down, you know, the Soviet wall came down. We were supposed to get all these dividends um, from the investments we made. And I'm still, I, I guess this discussion here today is a lot about that. You know, how do we share equally and fairly in the dividends that came from the investments that we made in the harbor? Uh, clean up. Go ahead. So um, before we open it up, I just want to talk about Moakley Park a little bit because okay. every single issue that's been put on the table, we're facing at Moakley Park. Moakley Park, many of you visited this morning um, down in South Boston on the edge of Dorchester, um, is really interesting. The study site is the park plus the area around the park because we are taking into account sea level rise and, and climate change and what's going to happen down there. Uh, it's incredibly complex. Moakley is one of the city's uh, five largest parks. Uh, it's the largest waterfront park, although you might never know it's a waterfront park because it's separated from the waterfront by a four-lane road, but it's um, immediately adjacent to Carson Beach. So it's technically on the waterfront, but separate. It's connected to, uh, or it's adjacent to a number of um, uh, middle-income and low-income neighborhoods, uh, but it's disconnected um, uh, by six lane roads from those. Um, it's on two T-stops, it's within a 15 minute bike ride of a significant portion of Boston's population. Uh, populations that include Dorchester, Roxbury, the South End, South Boston, uh, and even the Back Bay. And so it's right at the heart of a lot of things that we're talking about with some development pressures um, uh, immediately around it. And so we're, we've been charged with trying to figure it all out, uh, putting it all together uh, and trying to address all of this within the context of a, of a new vision plan for the park um, and a vision plan for the areas around the park and how we begin to think of truly integrating climate resilience with equity, with these economic issues, with these operations and maintenance issues all, all at once to make it a better community park for the folks who live there than it currently is, and to make it this kind of world-class destination park for the entire city and region, um, and really present the waterfront as part of what uh, Boston's uh, park system is about and what Boston is as a city. There's also a, a lot of historical symbolism in Carson Beach. Um, for those of us who've been in Boston for 40 years, we may remember some of the not so great um, racial tensions that were exhibited there um, back in the 70s. And so, I mean, for that reason alone, it, it's a kind of a nexus of a lot of these issues that we've been talking about. So, um, I'm going to fuse uh, two parts of a question together. You'll see where I'm going. Yes, Nick, I do believe uh, as, uh, there should be an agency for fun. Fun, healthy, and happy. And I'm saying that, you'll see, in a reason. When we talk about equity and how we design parks to be equitable, uh, there are ways both consciously or subconsciously we design it to be actually to not be equitable. We don't want to see basketball. Uh, we have rules. There are so many rules, it makes the park unfun, and I don't even want to be there. Uh, so we know there's a way you could do it with the rules. You could do it with design. You could do it with the number of grills. In fact, there was a park in Queens that was a football field. The demographics were changing. Soccer was being played, 
And literally before I got there, the Parks Department planted trees in the football field to avoid people from playing soccer on the football field. As we looked to the future about fun, healthy, this is true. We took the trees out, by the way. <laughs> They're gone. Thank you. I'm very happy about that. So we displaced the trees, put them somewhere else. The point is, as we talk about equity and building parks for all, whether on the public side or the private side, do we have these conversations about having equitable park m parks means it has programming, it has the art, it has the elements that are reflective of the community, and is there a conscious effort here in the Boston area to do just that? Because I can go in a park and feel that it's being planned to purposely exclude certain people because it'll make others uncomfortable. Anybody want to take that? I, I, I think there's a pretty good example that we saw earlier today of just that type of park with a lot of rules um, that um, may or may not limit the, the, the type of, of, of activity there. And I, I think that's, uh, we, we were over in East Boston and, and, and part of the, the tour was looking at Pierce Park um, that was over there. And um, one of the things that, that I, I, I think is encouraging to see is, is sort of a, a a recognition of the new ways of thinking about these 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 public spaces. I think in your presentation this morning, you gave a lot of good examples about, you know, particularly uh, the the fences. High fences feel safe, but when reality, they actually might actually make a place less safe or less welcoming. And so, I I think there are plenty of opportunities as we sort of progress through this new challenge of creating these new spaces to think critically about how things have been done in the past, how are other people doing things. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is go around the country and see parks. What a great job do I have? And fi like, figure out, like, what are we doing here in Boston? What, what are we not doing here in Boston? What, what are different ways of, of connecting to the communities? And so, um, yeah, I, I think the, the point is, is an excellent one. Um, I'm, I'm very excited that, that Massport is, is moving forward on, on the, the second phase of, of Pierce Park. Um, it's, it's promised to be an active space, so it'll be the polar opposite um, in, in theory of, of, of what's going on in, in Pierce Park One, which is, which is a beautiful space and, and, and serves its, its function, but to what exclusion is, is, is a very good question. And so thinking about that, and then um, it was very encouraged to see Massport put out this, this RFP for Pierce Park Phase Three, which is, is the derelict pier that's out in the water. Um, which is something that the, the trustees is, is, is very interested in and respond to that, that RFP. And, and um, fingers crossed, we, we may have the opportunity to work with Massport on that and actually creating uh, a community space that takes all of that into account. The history of East Boston, where the community came from, all the work that has already been done there, and, and what else can be done to, to really open it up and, and welcome everybody. Uh, I, I think it, uh, Representative uh, Madaro's point about meeting a couple from Brookline who is sitting in Low Presti Park, that, and, and that being shocking to him, was a, a good indication of something isn't quite right here. And we have a great opportunity to do something even better. And I think if um, the folks in East Boston uh, you know, work together to create uh, a fantastic 21st century park that takes all of that into account, that serves the needs of the community, that you know, there, there, there's a mixed income housing project right on the border there, right next to those million dollar condos. What are we doing that's gonna bring all of those people down to the park together and working together and, and playing together? So I, I think it's, it's a, a very important point, one that, that we've learned and saw firsthand looking at places like Brooklyn Bridge Park that um, I think we really wanna do everything that we can to, to accomplish here in Boston as well. I could just add, um, so part of our history as an organization is fighting uh, a community organizing battle uh, against a park in Chelsea that had installed Jersey barriers to prevent soccer playing from happening in the late 1990s. And so that is very much a part of our history and our present. Um, and then the other piece that I, I would want to add is making sure that parks are uh, accessible and appropriate and active but also that they even exist. And so the piece of land that was mentioned for the Eversore substation was actually supposed to be a soccer, a, a, a soccer field. The community of East Boston was promised a soccer field. And instead, they're getting a substation of Eversource on the Chelsea Creek. So that's I, it's just a big contradiction of how do we create these spaces and just make sure that people have access to them. 
think it's also important how you have these conversations about the future of open space um, and what your starting point is. Not um, how do you use the current open space today, because what you're really asking people do, to do is adapt their own habits and traditions to something that's been designed within a different context for a different set of people. It's starting by saying, what are the cultural traditions uh, from your community, from background that are important to you that you would then like us to, to, to design for uh, in a park going forward. Um, this, this is something that we're starting to address here in Toronto and a number of places, but it's really important to have open conversations uh, about this. There's an example in Silver Lake uh, in Los Angeles around the issue of an open multi-use meadow plus grills uh, and the community there said we don't want either of those because it would invite um, uh, a more diverse population in. Those are the kinds of things that we want to know about so that we can design for those activities uh, so that people really have, have a reason to go there uh, for themselves and also as we're designing um, the, the, to understand what are the signs, um, what are the kinds of artistic traditions, what are the things that people want to see that make them feel at home? Not the things that I would design for me, but, but things from their cultural traditions that could be placed into open spaces that would make it feel uh, more like a multicultural uh, uh, place. Picking up on what Chris was saying, um, I think that you know, in this kind of um, sense that we need to create democratic places, that we get quite um, hung up on making all spaces accessible to all people at all times. And in a sense, we don't, <coughs> places don't necessarily work that way. Um, but that's a real challenge, I think, as a designer. And I'm just wondering, so throwing it back to the panel that's something sort of temporal aspect and then how we measure success. Those are things that we're thinking about when you're working on these spaces. People hear that? Um, it was sort of uh, when, when we're trying to democratize public spaces, we sometimes get hung up on making sure that they're accessible to all people at all times, at all places, and all things. Um, and how do we uh, adjust for that and um, measure success? Uh, yeah, we're asked to take that on all the time. Um, and we do think about the multiple ways that, that open spaces will be used. One of the disadvantages right now in Moakley Park is that it's single-use facilities. You either use it as a baseball field or you don't use it at all. And so we start to think about, okay, how, how can uh, a single open space host different kinds of activities at different times of day that might invite different populations into the park on a rotating basis, right? So that's making, making things multifunctional uh, is one of those. Um, but the other piece is how do you make um, a space feel welcoming first? Uh, an inclusive, uh, a place that people want to stay. Um, that's something that, that, that it's, it's not an, I don't have the quick answer uh, to that question. It's something that is very topical right now, and it's something that we're exploring very hard um, with the partners and the communities that we're, we're working in. What, what is it um, uh, for each individual community that would make uh, an open space, welcoming and inclusive, and, and 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 inviting them to stay for longer periods of time. We're in the process of, of figuring that out on four different projects right now. I'll be able to report back uh, a little bit more in six months, but it's it's very much a, a, a current topic in a number of places across um, across North America, really. I mean, one of the things that interests me is, um, you know, also how do you get people to these uh, public spaces. Um, you know, the, the sort of linkages that are not so great in the city and in the region. Um, uh, you know, it's really a transportation question. Um, and, and so uh, making it possible to get there and then making it welcoming once you're there. I mean, I think there's, there's sort of two pieces to this, but I, there's, there's gotta be other questions. Really a question for Priscilla, um, mostly, but I'm, I'm curious, we had, this morning there was a little, or the earlier panel, there was a little bit of talk about um, kind of partnerships and uh, how we kind of work together to make a lot of these things happen. 
And earlier on, on our tour of Moakley this morning, Chris Cook, the, the Parks Commissioner, was, uh, gave an example of Spectacle Island and the way in which Spectacle is kind of a great example of a lot of different owners with you know, weird lines of ownership that get maintained by each other and it, it kind of just works, which seems uh, like not the typical example. So I'm really interested to hear from you what do you think would um, you know, help promote those types of relationships and the kind of co-management or co-maintenance of, of spaces and the sort of you know, make it easier basically for organizations like yourself you know, to, to, to enter into those kinds of agreements that are, that are you know, not, not one-offs essentially? So partnerships are so critical, and especially with the Boston Harbor Islands, and we have a wonderful relationship with um, all of the partners, and uh, especially work closely with Boston Harbor Now and also the National Park Service. Um, and that is a model, we, we've been really trying to work more closely with the National Park Service in a number of other areas as well, and that's that's helpful to us because each one brings something new to the table and a lot of that is is programming in fact we uh, just talked with Michael Creasy and uh, Liza Stearns about Roxbury Heritage that we're reopening after a major restoration and renovation and we really want to make sure that we have some dynamic programming and they have some great programs that we're going to learn from and hopefully partner with on on some of those but I think that you you bring up an excellent point I, I, we can't can't, we can't do this alone, and so we look for partnerships, um, whether it's to help us in some kind of uh, the programmatic functions or whether it's to help us um, to be able to do some of the capital repairs that we need to have. You know, we, as I mentioned before, we have some wonderful friends groups. We have some great partnerships. Um, you know, this isn't on the waterfront, but we just had a partnership with the, um, the Walden Woods Project and in our brand new visitor center at Walden, which is a gold LEED certified building, we're able to have a movie that is produced, executive produced by Ken Burns. Now that's not something that we would be able to get ourselves. And there have been other things in that regard, and so um, so we're we are always looking for for partnerships um, in communities. You know, some of our pools, uh, the deep water pools, are actually operated by some of the local communities, and that helps us with a partnership as well. We make some of the capital repairs, but then they operate it um, on a on a basis, which is which is wonderful for them too, because then they can hire some local kids, and and um, and it's a good experience. So. We're, we're always looking for those types of partnerships. I'd like to talk about capitalism just for another minute before we throw all capitalism <coughs> out. It's kind of interesting uh, to ask you about, do you feel at all hopeful about enlightened capitalism? Remembering as uh, Chris evoked, there was a history of landscape in the 19th century. It was speculative land development that gave us the Back Bay and some pretty terrific architecture along with much of the Emerald Necklace, the Esplanade, and other great uh, improvements. Given the costs and the maintenance concerns, can we look to enlighten capitalism to accelerate the rate of change? Is there profit potential, profit seeking that can support some of the public um, parks and amenities that you're all dreaming of? What do you think? I, I don't know that we can count on them to do it themselves on their own, just out of the goodness of their heart. Um, but there are certainly opportunities, and, and there are people in this room that, that work very hard to, to make sure that whenever there are developments happening, that um, proper attention is paid to, to the public realm, and, and, and uh, not only through the Chapter 91 mitigations in, in um, creating these open spaces, but what can be done on a, on a value capture uh, perspective to actually um, create a place for everyone out of what will inevitably be a, a fairly profitable development. I think that's one of the the tactics that you've seen, particularly in you know New York City, Brooklyn Bridge Park is a great example. Governor's Island is another example where they actually have pieces of it set aside specifically for development. It's back from the water. It, it's it's unobtrusive, but it's there and is going to go for some serious money, condo wise but it helps to pay for the public realm. Um, uh, our opportunities for, for stepping back from the water are limited, unless, of course, we get pushed back, like the, the folks in the other panel were just talking about. Um, 
but uh, making sure that we're doing everything that we can to, to, to leverage those partnerships. And, and I just to, in case of my developer friends are in the room, um, not to throw them under the bus, there are many people in, within the development community who are very interested in this very subject and, and making sure that, that we're doing every, that they're doing everything that, that they can to help promote this issue. And so um, I, I think when we're talking about public-private partnerships, it's not only the public nonprofits, it's, it's the truly private partners um, that we either need to give them a path to come to the table or bring them to the table if they're a little reluctant. Um, but but I, I think there is the opportunity there for, for sure. Go ahead. I just want to say, I, I mean, so the system is clearly not working. Capitalism is not working for the poor. It's not working for communities of color. Um, but it's what we have, and so I do think that there are ways of leveraging resources um, with the hope of transitioning into an economy that is more of a public good than of uh, what than creating profits. And so that's I think that's our experience in our community, and that's the experience of a lot of low-income communities of color. Thank you. I, I got like a two-minute warning over here, but. Do you want to take the last question? You know, we've, we've talked a lot about how to engage the local neighborhood to figure out what they want and what would fit within their context. But how do we ensure also that we get the larger citywide perspective? You know, we've all been involved. I've been on many advisory projects here in the city. You end up in a pitched battle usually about what not to do there. You know, we spent five years on the downtown municipal harbor plan over arguing about the height of one building and the dimensions of its footprint, rather than really debating and discussing what does the city as a whole need to connect itself better to the waterfront in a really prime location. So I just want to raise, there's, we always put a lot of people on advisory committees who are neighbors or, or whatever, but I think we often miss putting them on and could bring that broader perspective, kind of like we heard from the commissioner this morning. <coughs> Yeah, I think that's where you have um, multiple groups uh, that can be assembled to advise uh, on these projects. Some of them have to be um, uh, local residents, the immediate abutters, the obvious stakeholders. Uh, but then I think it's incumbent on um, the folks in charge of those projects to put together a number of other committees as well that can start to bring these other citywide issues to the fore. Um, but then you have to have a committee of the committees, which sounds like a lot of meetings, but, um, and it is, um, but uh, having people from these different groups and these different geographies talk to one another is really, really critical because I never want to be the one trying to make those decisions in the middle without the other folks. Putting the, the bigger group together allows everybody to hear everybody else's opinions, needs, wants, desires, requirements, et cetera, et cetera, values. Um, and, and having those conversations, I think, can be some of the most productive ones uh, that you can. Um, with, with Boston Parks, we're, we're working to do that right now. On Mokley, it's, it's what happened um, with energy and environment on East Boston. Massport, Mass Dot were in the room at the same time that uh, representatives from local communities uh, were there. So these these conversations between people who don't normally talk to one another, I think, are the the biggest key. Okay. Well, we we've covered a lot of ground, um, a lot of water. Um, so I wanted to thank the panel for their help today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.